LDS historian's office. Oh. The 19th century way of keeping records and keeping history. So. Well, we understand that you have some unique thing you like to do with your money. Dealing with documents. Oh, um, yeah, there is a statement in there huh, where uh, I love smelling old manuscripts in the morning. <laughs> I did not write that. I just copied it from I someone remember else. I writing that myself. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a, an untrue statement. I thought it was kind of quaint. It, it's, uh, you know, Usually I'm not quite so informal in my introduction to my right. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. I hope you're okay. Um, I'm a huge proponent of making history fun. When I was in high school, uh, I loved both of my history teachers, but, well, one of them was quite fun. Um, but, it, you know, history kind of has the stereotype of not being very fun. So we're going to have fun tonight. All right, if I say the words, you have died of dysentery, does anyone know the cultural meaning of that? I think, I think we have a mixed audience here where maybe three of us. Who has played the Oregon Trail game? <laughs> Sophie, have you played it? Uh, yes. <laughs> you at least know about it. All right, so we're going to learn a little bit about a video game that was very popular in the 80s and early 90s, um, and its cultural impact on us today. So, all right. Um, I have a problem. I'm getting old, and my, I, I need reading glasses, but I haven't got those glasses where it's the progression yet, so I'm sorry if I'm fiddling with my glasses a little too, too much tonight. Do you need more light? No, 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 this okay. is fine. All right, so, what's history? And feel free to, I, I, this is more of a conversation than a lecture. History, um, when I grew up, it was memorizing names and dates, that was kind of the stereotype, right? That is not history. Don't let anyone tell you that that's what history is. That's the boring history. History is the stories that we tell ourselves about the past. History changes all the time. History uh, is modified as we gather new sources. Um, history is shaped by our ideologies and worldview. Uh, history is deeply, deeply interesting. I love history. Um, but there's kind of the history, and then there's the history. Um, there's kind of some uncontested facts about the past, right? We're here to talk about the Oregon Trail. Uh, this is something that is uncontested. There was, in fact, such a thing as the Oregon Trail. Um, there's a certain time frame that it happened. There were a lot of people that, that experienced the Oregon Trail. But what the Oregon Trail means to us has changed. That's changed since the very beginning. In fact, the Oregon Trail meant a lot of things to the people living at the time, right? So, um, so just a brief uh, background. Oregon Trail, 2,000 miles long. Uh, at the very beginning, it started in Missouri, and across the Missouri River, and then you ended in uh, Oregon, present-day Oregon, although for the people at the time, Oregon was just kind of a nebulous somewhere out in the west, right? Um, it, about from 1840 to 1869, that's kind of the traditional dates of when they say the Oregon Trail was there. Before 1840, you had a lot of fur trappers and explorers and Spanish and British and Russians even that came down, but there wasn't really the trail there. And then 1869, we all know what happened in 1869, the railroad came along. Um, although, people are still walking across the country after the railroad, which I find kind of interesting. May I ask a question? Of course, yes. Why did the train head to California instead of Oregon? So, um, great question. Uh, most people were interested in Oregon early on, throughout the 1840s. In the 
1849, uh, we've got, of course, the discovery of gold in California, and that put California on the map. Um, and we had a lot of people interested in going to California, even though there was mining throughout all of the Intermountain West, obviously. And so, so yeah, that's kind of the difference between the Oregon Trail. There is a Californian Trail. This is a very handy map from the uh, um, the uh, government site, NPS, yeah, dot maps. Um, and I've only clicked on the Oregon Trail, but of course you've got the uh, Mormon Pioneer Trail, you've got the California Trail. For those that wanted to go further south, you've got, oh, whoops, the Santa Fe Trail. So you've got a bunch of thoroughfares through the country. The Oregon Trail is most popular um, for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll talk about today. There are about 400,000 people that use the Oregon Trail, which is kind of a shocking number to think about. Um, so, motivation for people going to Oregon, uh, it's probably as different as the number of people going, but generally speaking, you've got kind of an economic interest, uh, you've got health benefits, uh, you've also got kind of a promise of a new life, you know, why, why do people do things today? Sometimes it's just, I'm sick of my old life, I want to change, I want to see if I can improve my life. But there's also things going on in America that they, people want to escape. There's the leading up to the Civil War, uh, not the nicest time in America at the time. There were a lot of fighting, um, ideological fighting, so people were kind of tired of that, wanting to escape. Uh, sometimes you're literally escaping crimes. Uh, sometimes you've robbed someone or even murdered someone and you want to escape. Uh, go out west. Um, and then, the, of course, there's uh, um, missionary opportunities. A lot of people are going out west to try to convert the, the natives. So anyway, there's a lot of motivations for why people are going out west. Um, all right, let's see. Here's this diary. I talked earlier about what is history. History is essentially the collection of all the sources available and trying to reconstruct a narrative. So this is one person's diary. Uh, this is a man by the name of Samuel Stout. Um, this is July 1851 diary. And what do you note about the journal? It's fairly straightforward, a daily journal. Um, the very top, upper left, 10 miles brought us to Willow Creek, where we camped. Sounds about like my journal sometimes, right? <laughs> Two, a hard drive brought us, brought us to the bottom of Bear River, where we camped at a spring, no wood. So this is a diary where he's just kind of documenting what's going on, right? He's talk, documenting the miles, he's documenting the, the scenery, et cetera, et cetera. We have hundreds of these kinds of diaries. Uh, these are crucial in reconstructing the experience of the Oregon Trail. Um, all right. Yes, please, question. It also shows that he's educated. His cursing is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. There are those that were doing that that were illiterate, so they wouldn't have journals. So. Yeah. Shows a lot about the character of the person. Yeah, any, any time you're reading a journal, you're already selecting kind of a certain class of people, right? In the 1850s, literacy was good um, in America, but it wasn't like it is today. And so, you know, if you're interested in the uh, experience of the non-educated people that went through the Oregon Trail, you're not going to be able to recover them as easily because you're not going to have written records. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, Oregon Trail. There's kind of this mythology around it. Now, coupling history with mythology, a lot of people don't like that, but um, we have a mythology about history, right? Um, there are certain things about the past that we celebrate, we put on pedestals, we kind of have an idea about, 
but we might not have an actual understanding of. So for instance, when someone says, oh, the founding fathers, et cetera, et cetera, I don't know that that statement often is said by someone who has studied deeply what the founding fathers have said, right? They just have this idea in their head of what the founding fathers said. Or, you know, oh, the good old days and the, the you know, whatever. We kind of mythologize some of this stuff, right? And that happens because, as I said earlier, history changes depending on what our uh, needs are. Okay. I've rambled on enough now to the fun part where we get to the Oregon Trail. Okay. Does everyone know what the Oregon Trail video game is? Is there anyone that doesn't? All right. We are in for a treat because this is such a cultural phenomenon. All right. So, 1971, there's a guy in Minnesota who is a student teacher. He's a brand new teacher. He's teaching sixth grade, um, I think sixth grade, and he is really frustrated. Not just because he's a teacher, but he's a teacher trying to teach the 19th century Western expansion. <laughs> and he's having a hard time getting those sixth graders interested in the history. And so, He's, a, he's in his apartment, and he's trying to make a board game to make it more interesting for his students. He's like, if I can make a board game, we'll have a map, I'll have all these cards that you can draw, I'll do roll some dice, we'll make this into a game. Kind of like Candyland, but for Oregon Trail. Well, his two roommates come into the apartment, and they're like, oh, what you doing? His roommates are also student teachers, so they're all commiserating on how hard it is. And this, this guy is saying, well, I'm trying to make a board game about the Oregon Trail to make it more interesting for my students. Well, these two, two roommates, they have also taken computer classes. And they're like, you know what? We should make this into a computer game. And they're all like, brilliant. Let's do it. So, this is, again, 1971. Computer games are not the most... Uh, artistic things in the world. So they have what's called a teletype, and this is even before my day, so forgive me if I don't have uh, anything accurate, but a teletype is where it's connected to the internet, and you're, but it's just a typewriter. You're typing in, so this game that they create is purely word-based. So it's essentially, you're going on the trail, do you want to buy supplies? And you have to type yes. And then they say, okay, here's a list of supplies. What do you want to buy? And then they have to type out what they want to buy. And then, you know, you're halfway through the trail and food's running low. So you're like, okay, I want to go hunting. And they say, okay. And then it kind of waits and waits and like, oh, you see a deer. And then they have to hurry and type, bang, to shoot the gun. <laughs> and if they type it fast enough and accurate enough, then they get the food. So really primitive, really kind of, uh, I mean, I don't know, but it worked. The students were enthralled. They loved it. They thought it was great. And so the guy, uh, I should give the guy's name because first I have it and I, have to, I should give him proper attribution. Don Rawich and his roommates were Bill Heinemann and Paul Dillenberger. Dillenberger, I think he was having a problem teaching because of his last name. Um, anyway, so after this unit was completed, after the Oregon Trail was done, um, this, this guy, Ron, or Don, printed off all the code. This is when you could print off your entire code on a sheet, and he put it in his closet. He's like, that's it. I'm done. It served me well. And that would have been the history of the game, except for three things. Now, what are the three things? Well, first and foremost, um, the Soviet Union, obviously. So, the 1970s, 1980s, this is the height of the Cold War. Um, what was America? They were always in competition with the USSR, right? And one of the big things was, we're not teaching our students good enough. We're going to have all these Russians that are going to be way better educated. We need to do something to better educate our students. And so the federal government handed out gobs of money as grants to try to get education better. And so there was this uh, company called the uh, Minneapolis, let me get the exact name correct, uh, the Min Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. It's 
sounds like a government acronym name. <laughs> anyway, they, they formed this company and they said, we're going to make games that can be in the classroom so that we can teach our students better. Well, this worked out perfectly for the other reason. Video games were a terrible, terrible thing, according to a lot of people in America, right? What, what were the youth doing? They were going out to arcades and wasting their money and hanging around, around poor influences. And I mean, you, you guys all lived this era. You know what it was, what it was like. Yep. It was terrible. Yep. <laughs> and so you were there at the arcade. You were playing Pac-Man, uh, Ms. Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man. Um, you were playing Asteroids. Donkey Kong. Um, it was a terrible, terrible time, right? So, <laughs> so the parents said, no, we can't have this. Video games should be educational. And then the third thing, video games had, the video game market was crashing. It crashed, essentially. There was such a glutton of video games that, um, yeah, uh, video game de developers, designers were trying to figure out a new way to uh, get into the market. And so there's this kind of coalition of all this stuff that made um, educational video games or edutainment uh, a thing. And so this Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, MEECC, they had just recently hired Don and Don said, wait, I have this game that I, that I created. And so he took out his old Oregon Trail game and he uh, showed it to his boss and they had a whole team that made it, or that said, this is great. And thus, the Oregon Trail was born. And within years, very few years, this was in, I think the number was 8,000 school districts throughout the country. So, if you were a student in elementary school between about 1985 and 1995, it's very likely that you played this game. And I was one of those students uh, at, at an elementary school. I remember after typing, the speed typing, learning how to type, and I had enough free time, I could play this game. And it was great. It was amazing. I don't know that I learned a lot about the Oregon Trail, as we'll get to, but it was a lot of fun. So, we're going to play the Oregon Trail. I'm going to show you what the play looks like, and then I want, throughout the game, to stop and talk. Because, remember how I showed you that diary? And remember how we could read it as kind of a historical source? We could analyze it, say, what, well, the educational, uh, you know, the educational background, he was able to create this, and uh, the environment helps us understand this source. It's the same thing with this video game. We can treat a video game as a source. What does this video game tell us about 1980s culture in America? So, Oregon Trail. You may, one, travel the trail, two, learn about the trail, three, see the Oregon top 10, of course it has to be a competition, four, turn the sound off, five, choose management options, or six, end. I, as I was thinking about this, I thought maybe we should be democratic, but I don't think we will for this. We're gonna first learn about the trail, because I'm a historian. <laughs> All right, so this essentially, this essentially explains the rules, yes. Oh yeah, no, we should make it bigger. All right. Thank you. Try taking a journey by covered wagon across 2,000 miles of plains, rivers, and mountains. Try! Man, I can just feel the excitement. Uh, on the plains, you will slosh your oxen through mud and water-filled ruts, or will you plod through dust six inches deep? They're really selling this. How will you cross the rivers? If you have money, you might take a ferry, if there is a ferry. Or you can ford the river and hope you and your wagon aren't swallowed alive. What about supplies? Well, if you're low on food, you can hunt. You might get a buffalo. You might. And there are bear in the mountains. At the Dalles, you can try navigating the Columbia River, but if running the rapids with a makeshift raft makes you queasy, better take the Barlow Road. Uh, and then here's the... Here's the danger. If you, for some reason you don't survive, your wagon burns, or thieves steal your oxen, or you run out of provisions, or you die of cholera, don't give up. Try again and again until your name is up with the others on the Oregon Top Ten. All right, so 
Let's travel the trail. All right. Many kinds of people made the trip to Oregon. You may, one, be a banker from Boston, two, be a carpenter from Ohio, three, be a farmer from Illinois, four, find out the differences between these choices. What is your choice? We're gonna be a banker. Banker is always the best. The banker is always the best, you know why? Yeah. <laughs> they have the most money. They start out with the most money, which is not actually accurate. Okay, this is where I'm gonna ruin the game for everybody. So, all right. It is true that most of the immigrants on the Oregon Trail were middle class. Um, but if you were a farmer, you had all of the supplies, most all of the supplies already. Um, so we will see, once you choose, that just kind of gives you the starting money that you have. But then you have to buy all the supplies. Well, if you were a farmer of the day, it took about, uh, let's see, where did I write this down? If you were 60 to 80% of the travelers were farmers. So that, that's a, the vast majority of the immigrants on the Oregon Trail were farmers. And if you were a farmer, it took you about $50 per person, which for the time, that's not insubstantial, but it's, it's not bad. Uh, if you had to buy your own material, it was about $150 to $200 per person. So farmers were what, th that was the cheat code as it were. But in this game, it's the banker. All right, so what is the first name of the wagon leader? Wow. <laughs> it has to be me, right? <laughs> All right, what are the first names of the four other members in your party? Okay, let's stop here. Well, you better not leave Emily behind. <laughs> right off the bat, it sets you up as a unit, right? Five members. It doesn't have to be a family, but the, based upon the image, it's pretty much kind of a husband, wife, and kids, right? That's not inaccurate. There are a lot of families that came across the Oregon Trail. But the interesting thing that this game doesn't point out is that there were a lot of single men that went across the Oregon Trail, a lot of them. And it was pretty easy. In fact, you could do it for next to nothing and you could probably make some money. Because the thing about the Oregon Trail, you needed people to essentially take care of stuff. You had to run the oxen, you had to, um, just all the various manual labor on the trail. And society at the time looked to men to do that. If you were a single woman and wanted to go on that Oregon Trail, good luck. I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm sure it happened, but it, that, was, that was a rare, rare exception. But women often <coughs> crossed the trail. But they were usually mothers who were either pregnant or had young children or both. And so this right here kind of sets up the family unit as a traveling uh, company, which is a little problematic. All right, so uh, Robin and Emily, and then uh, <coughs> I guess I'm going to go through my kids and leave out two of them because I have five kids. So. All right. So me, my wife, and my three older kids are going on the trip. We're going to Oregon. Hooray. All right. It is 1848. Your jumping off place for Oregon is Independence, Missouri. You must decide which month to leave Independence. <laughs> July is, is a terrible time. Let's go with the ask advice. Uh, you attend a public meeting. Uh, if you leave too early, there won't be any grass for your oxen to eat. If you leave too late, you may not get to Oregon before winter comes. If you leave at just the right time, there will be green grass and the weather will still be cool. So, that is true, right? You gotta time it just right. You don't want to leave too late, you don't want to leave too early. So. We'll leave in April. Does that sound right? Okay. Oh, Independence. Independence, Missouri. This was a very, very common uh, launching point. You either started from Independence or a little bit later in the decade, you started at St. Joe uh, in Missouri. Um, now again, the Oregon Trail went clear through 1869,
But they started the railroad, I think in 1864. So the railroad was working its way out west. And so the further the railroad was, you could start out further west. Um, and you also had settlements that started to creep through the western uh, United States. So you could, whereas in 1848 it started independence, if you left in 1850s or so, you'd go to the settlement of Canesville, started by the, the Latter-day Saints. Um, so this was a kind of a moving target. Did I see a question? Yeah. So why was it in Kansas City when they called it independence? Well, so independence was the first I mean, Kansas City was a later thing. They, they, what's it called, Kansas City? I mean, Independence and Kansas City are two different settlements, but Independence was the earlier one, I, I think. Kansas City became much bigger later on. Um, I should double check on that, but I think that's what's going on there. And okay. Wait, were the Mormons there, and then that became more of a hub, or was it a hub when the Mormons got there? Uh, Mormons got there in 18, the early 1830s. And right? you would have had some leaving from that point. There, there were people leaving as early as the 1830s, but it was pretty rare. It really kind of started in the 1840s, which by that point they had left, most of them had left into Illinois, into Nauvoo. So. What's that? They said they come back, but they were in Missouri, they went back to Yeah, yeah. So they, they were not jumping off to go west of that. Yep, yep, exactly. Okay. Before leaving Independence, you should buy equipment and supplies. You have $1,600 in cash. Woo! We are rich. But you don't have to spend it all now. You can buy whatever you need at Matt's General Store. So. Oh, I have a question. So is the yeah. money actually like, just accurate for the time period? Like that, that is when you yeah, 1600 that's Yeah, 1600 that's about right. Well, right, right. I just wasn't sure if it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is adjusted for inflation. 1600 is a lot of money at the time. Yeah. Um, the U.S. at the time didn't have a ton of cash flowing around. It was, it was much more of a barter system and kind of an on-credit type system. But if you were outfitting for the Oregon Trail, you essentially needed cash because there wasn't any other way around it. Okay, so you need oxen. You need clothing for both summer and winter. Plenty of food for your trip, ammunition for your rifles, spare parts for your wagon. All right, so we need oxen. We're going to buy some oxen. Uh, there are two oxen in a yoke. I recommend at least three yokes. That is accurate. You would want two yoke to take your wagon, with the third yoke kind of trailing behind, and you would rotate those out to give give your animals a rest. So we're going to th buy three yoke of oxen, which is hundred and twenty dollars. Food. We want food. He recommends you take at least 200 pounds of food for each person in your family. That is a lot of food. So, we're going to go. 1,000 pounds. Uh, clothing. You'll need warm clothing in the mountains. I recommend taking at least two sets of clothes per person. Per person. Each set is $10. So we'll do that. Ammunition. Uh, boxes of 20 bullets. Uh, Here's Lots of bullets, huh? You guys are, you guys are eager to. You want more than that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot. All right, and then spare parts. Uh, you, your wagons break down all the time. And it was true at this time that wagons kind of had interchangeable parts. So you could. Uh, make all of these changes. So how many wagon wheels? Look at three, three axles, three. Was five. there a weight limit like the hand carts? There is a weight limit, uh, or rather there's, uh, not in the game, but, oh. um, sorry, I have all of these notes and I have to go find them. So. I shouldn't have jumped ahead, sorry. No, no, no it's all right. Mm -hmm. Wagons, there are, there are different kinds of wagons. You of course had the hand carts that were popularized uh, by the um, Mormons in 1857 onward. That was a way to go. It was the cheapest way to go. Um, you couldn't take a lot of supplies with you. And there were um, various different wagons. You kind of had a really fancy wagon. You had kind of a smaller wagon. The smaller wagon could take a, about 1,800 to 2,200 pounds. So qu quite a bit. Um, 
So yeah, if you want to take personal belongings. yeah personal belongings. Um, on that note, um, let's talk about what else you might have taken. So this is actual history, not the game. Uh, food. Uh, you had guides, uh, printed guides that recommended spending about uh, um, one hundred and fifty dollars for food for four people for six months. It's the equivalent of about 5,000 today, adjusted for inflation. Uh, inflation. Each family would have one water keg on your, uh, on your wagon. Each adult, it was recommended to take 200 pounds of flour, 150 pounds of bacon, 200, and when they say bacon, that's kind of generic salted pork. 20 pounds of sugar, 10 pounds of salt, um, it, it was at this time canned food was a thing, but it was extremely expensive and extremely heavy. So usually you're getting dry stuff. Um, so flour, bacon, sugar. One of the problems on the trail: scurvy. You didn't have a lot of vitamin C with these rations, right? Uh, they recommended taking tobacco, not just for personal use, but also for trading. And then they recommended taking 25 pounds of soap, because wash day, washing your clothes, washing yourself, you had to do it about once or twice a month. <laughs> and that's about what it was. So. <laughs> All right. Okay, ready to start. Let's go on our journey. Independence. Um, all right. We gotta get going. We gotta get going to uh, Corey. So, this is what the major gameplay looks like. It gives you the date at the top, gives you the weather, the health of your company, pace, and your rations. So, here are your options. You can continue on the trail, check supplies, look at the map, change pace, change food rations, stop to rest, attempt to trade, talk to people, buy supplies. So, let's look at this map. This is where we are at. We're starting here at Independent. There is the Oregon Trail. So we're going to go, because I want to give you guys a kind of a sense of what's happening. Every space bar is, or rather, you can kind of see the days going. April 3rd, April 4th. Oh, they move. Fifth. We're going pretty good. All right. We're now at Kansas River Crossing. Would you like to look around? Sure, let's look around. Peaceful display. All right. Um, let's keep going. We're doing so good. You must cross the river in order to continue. The river at this point is currently 624 feet across and 4.3 feet deep in the middle. So they give us an option. You may attempt to ford the river, cock the wagon and float it across, take a ferry across, wait to see if its conditions approve, or get more information. All right, I didn't understand this as a kid, so I was ferried across, and I never made it very often. So uh, we're actually a uh, Bostonian banker. We have the money to spend, so we're gonna take a ferry. Five dollars to wait two days. This is accurate. There's one account saying that there were about 100 wagons waiting for the ferry to get across. If you had the rights or the ability to have a ferry, you were making significant money. But yes, we were willing to wait. So we wait two days and then, ah, there we go. The wagon is crossing the river. Hooray, we made it. Okay. All right, now we're going. Wrong trail, lose two days. All right, let me talk about the wrong trail. The Oregon Trail in 1840, it's possible that you may have missed the trail. Uh, but by 1848, there's really not any chance of you losing the trail. It was so well marked, it was so obvious. And I forgot to mention this earlier. This game has you playing or going along all by yourself, right? You're a party of five. You're going by your lonesome. That did not happen. You were support. You were surrounded by all the other immigrants 
they had immigrant, immigrant trains, safety in number. Um, it, it was, it made no sense to go by yourself. All right, so here we go. Coming up along a river, I forgot what river we're going to. Uh, Big Blue River. Yes, of course, let's look around. Ah, beautiful. All right, so let's uh, keep going. You must cross the river. It's 220 feet across and 2.3 feet deep in the middle. All right, let's attempt to ford it, shall we? I'm so nervous. It was a muddy crossing, but you did not get stuck. Okay. All right, crossing the river on your own was pretty, pretty challenging, honestly. There were a lot of times where there were holes in the river or loose rocks or whatnot. Oxen would trip, um, people would trip. Drowning was a very common way to die uh, on the Oregon Trail. In fact, and in the game, and in the game, yeah, and in the game, not to be. We might, we might lose some here. I won't spoil it, so. All right, let's go. We lost another trail. I'm not a very good leader. <laughs> All right, our food, we're at 680 pounds. We're still doing great. We've traveled 300 miles. All right, we're at Fort Kearney. Hooray. Yes, absolutely, let's look around. Okay, here we are. Uh, forts were a very, very important part of the trail. Um, I think almost all of them started out as private forts or forts for kind of the fur trade, uh, other things. But then the U.S. government, the military, would uh, have purchased a lot of the forts. It was just a recognition that there were a lot of U.S. citizens crossing the country, and this was a way to protect the citizens, um, not only from um, native hostilities, which we'll talk about that later, but from just people got on the trail and they were didn't know what they were doing or they had emergencies or they ran out of supplies, the forts were a very important part of the trail. All right, okay, we're going to, to the Sea Chimney Rock. I'm going too fast in this. All right, our scenery changed. We're now to a gray color here. An ox wanders off. Very common. Not great. The ox is interesting. Okay, we'll stop here to talk about animals. All right, there was a pretty heated debate on what animal you should, you should take. Most said you should take oxen. The advantages of oxen were that they survived perfectly fine on prairie grass, um, and they were pretty docile and they could carry a lot of stuff. But there was a smaller group that said mules are the way to go. Mules could also survive on prairie grass, and they were a lot easier to shop. I don't understand the ins and outs of it, but the oxen's hoof is cloven, so you have to have two pieces of, of, a, of a shoe, whereas with the mule, you only needed the one, so it was a lot easier that way. But mules were hungry. Not, not very easy to get along with. So most people took the ox or the oxen. I'm a little, we've broken the wagon axle. Yes. Hooray, we were able to repair it. Okay. People suffered what they called mountain fever. Mountain fever is just kind of a generic term for various ailments. Um, probably, well, I'm not a doctor, but kids in particular struggled with disease on the trail. Um, and we'll wait a little bit to see if we get any more diseases to talk about as well. What is mountain fever? Did they figure it out? Not that I could find, but it, it's possible. All right. Chimney Rock. Uh, we've made it this far. Um, remember how it said water is poor, or what is it say exactly? The hard truck, or having a hard time finding the water. Um, the stretch from about, 
now the uh, look at So the stretch from about Fort Laramie, or no, about Chimney Rock to South Pass is known as the Great American Desert. Now, for those of you that have traveled on that road, you're probably wondering why did they call it the Great American Desert? Well, it was because there wasn't a lot of water for the oxen. The grass was a little tough. There was a lot of sandy places. It really was a hard place to cross on the, uh, on the Oregon Trail. Um, yeah, I'll just look at that. All right, um, I have to check our supplies because I forgot what our food is like. We have 400 pounds of food. We'll be fine. Okay, Fort Laramie. All right, inadequate grass. Oh, we're getting more grass. Hooray. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Emily has the measles. Okay. This was a pretty serious thing to travel on the Oregon Trail. Because what have, what have you done? You've essentially taking, taken a whole bunch of people from a lot of different areas, and you've brought them into one very small corridor and brought them through the United States. And diseases like the measles spread very quickly uh, in and out of the, the various um, companies. It, it, was pretty, it was pretty rough. Okay, Pastor Grace site. Would you like to look closer? Here lies Voland. Hey, 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 come out and play. Right. Uh, <laughs> seeing gravestones on the Oregon Trail or seeing freshly dug graves, very, very common. Um, when all is said and done, uh, there were about 15,000. No, sorry, 150,000 people wow. that died on the Oregon Trail. Over how many years? Uh, Just curious. That, that was over about 20 years, I wow. believe. That was like yeah. It doesn't actually make sense. It? Yeah, it was 15,000. I wrote down 150,000, but it's quite possible I mis mistook that. But it was a lot. There was a significant number of people that, that died on the Oregon Trail. And a lot of those were young kids, older, older individuals. Okay, one of our oxen has died. That's very sad. We are now at Fort Laramie. Would you like to look around? Yes, we would like to. Okay, Fort Laramie, very important uh, outpost. Um, it was a private trading post started in the 1830s. In 1849, it was purchased by the U.S. Army. Uh, it was a really important place for, uh, again, kind of gathering supplies. It's also a very important place for natives and settlers and government officials to kind of get come together and and meet. I think there was a treaty that was signed at Fort Laramie. So speaking of Native Americans. Here we have up there the teepees. There's a native on a pony. What is the what is the portrayal of natives in this game? What have we noticed so far? And more importantly, what does it tell us about 1980s American culture? Remember how I said we can treat this as a source? There's nothing. I haven't seen anything really. We haven't seen anything, really. Yeah, this, this is this is kind of a background in the background. Um, I will give them credit. It could have been a lot worse, right? Um, there, there is a stereotype that the natives were, uh, you know, people were going to the Oregon Trail and they were dying from native attacks. You would die from a disease way more frequently than you would die from. Native American attack. And the native natives would usually attack because they were being attacked as well. Not just kind of people were invading their home, but there were there's one story of an individual who saw a native um, at I think it was at a fort, and he essentially kidnapped him and said, Oh, I'm gonna make this native my slave. So he, he tied him up, 
tied a rope around his neck into the wagon, and for the next 10 days, he forced him along the wagon, and he was just there whipping him, saying, you're going to be my slave. Um, so just horrendous, horrendous uh, activities towards, towards the natives. All right, let's continue. Oh, whoops. Oh, yeah, we should buy an oxen home. Man, you guys are good. Uh, buy some supplies. So we'll buy some supplies. Let's buy another oxen. We'll buy one oxen. And then food. food. No, we fixed it. We didn't replace it. Yeah. So how many, how many pounds of food? How far are we? Are we halfway? Not yet. Not even halfway yet. So, so then we better. 500. 500 yeah. pounds. Emily has to do all the cooking. So. <laughs> All right, let's leave the store. Let's keep it going. Okay, we're going to Independence Rock. Was there no medicines and stuff? Did they not have that, really? No. Medicine at this time was still 19th century medicine. If you were sick, the best thing to do was to not call the doctor. So if <laughs> yeah, you're, they would uh, bleed you. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a time traveler and you find yourself in the early 1900s and you get sick, just drink a lot of water and eat. <laughs> okay, find wild fruit. Why is this such a big deal? Because of the scurvy. Vitamin C. Remember what I talked about earlier? Scurvy. There, there was scurvy. It was an issue. People knew about it, but they didn't quite understand what caused it. Scurvy, for those that don't know, it's a lack of vitamin C in your diet. There were some immigrant guides that said, if you ever see wild fruit, eat it. It helps with scurvy. So they seem to have a correlation between that. But the wild fruit, particularly on the Oregon Trail, was you should eat the wild fruit. Did they pull the big fruit on the trail? No. Uh, it was essentially whatever you found. Okay. Independence Rock. There we go. What a lovely uh, scene. Okay. This is, too, this is too easy. You guys aren't getting the true perspective <laughs> of Oregon Trail. Okay, very little water. We're at... Uh, Bad water. Inadequate grass. Cecily has exhaustion. <laughs> Cecily just needs to. Okay, question is for the young children, for the pregnant women, would you ride in the wagon? Better to walk. Not unless you absolutely had to. The wagon had no springs really. Riding over that, it was really rough. Um, not the best. Now, remember this, the thing that said bad water? That was a real issue for a lot of people. So, you had thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people crossing um, the America. They, you had to find the water. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it here because our health is fair. Well, I'm, I'll wait. Hold that thought on the bad water. Very little water, inadequate grass. You find an abandoned wagon with the following, 42 bullets, all right? <laughs> Not that we don't have a bullet shortage. Um, abandoned wagons. This was so, so common. From Missouri to about where we're at in Wyoming, you had people taking a lot of stuff. And then you see the Rocky Mountains and people are like, no, thank you. And so you would have people abandoning all sorts of things on the trail. In fact, there are, there are some people that essentially call it a junkyard, where you have pianos and furniture and just all sorts of things just abandoned there. Uh, the Latter-day Saints in Utah, they would literally send people out onto the trail to gather up this abandoned material. Um, they were essentially scavenging parties. Um, this was very common where Stuff was just abandoned. All right, we're now at South, South Pass. Here we go. Hooray. South Pass. Let's go look, let's look at the map. This is just, so this is kind of in our neck of the woods. South Pass in Wyoming, Fort Bridger, Wyoming, Soda Springs, Idaho. This is the Great Salt Lake. Here's Bear Lake up here. So this is kind of the area where from about here to here, the, the water is poor, the grass is poor. Once they pass South Pass and get into Soda Springs, 
it's just so much better. The grass is better. A lot of the journals that talk about Soda Spring, they love it because it's it's kind of this lush area. All right, let's continue on the trail. Oh, here we go. The trail divides here. You may head for Green River Crossing or head for Fort Bridger. What do you want to do? So, for the South Pass, we can either go down to Fort Bridger. It's it's uh, safer because you can resupply, or you can do a cutoff and go to Soda Springs. We have enough supplies. <laughs> we have plenty of supplies. We don't need so. So cutoffs, shortcuts, they were very common. Um, some of them were very deadly. Uh, we've all heard of the Donner Party. They were following a shortcut, and it didn't do them any good. Um, there, there are a number of others. Uh, after 1848, in fact, this game should uh, have had it. Maybe it's a little early, but there's what they call the Salt Lake Cutoff. If you were going to Oregon, it was about as fast or about the same distance to go down to Salt Lake and then up through, um, what's the, kind of by Idaho, the City of the Rocks, kind of up by that way. And the advantage of going to Salt Lake is that there, it's this whole settlement where you could resupply, you could fix your wagons, you could trade for supplies, things like that. But I guess it's a little too early for that. So, very little water. It's historically inaccurate. We're in a nice place. Sure, let's look around the Green River. So, a lot of the river, the Platte River in Nebraska and Wyoming, it was, it was a river that ran from west to east, right? A lot of people thought, well, let's navigate that. Or rather, they would hope to have done that, but it's just too shallow to do that. And so, they couldn't, they couldn't navigate on that. Um, let's continue. All right, the Green River is 400 feet across and 20 feet deep. See, third year old, third grade year old me would have said, oh, yeah, let's just afford it, but. <laughs> Should we try to call the wagon and float it across? Take a ferry. Huh. <laughs> 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 no family oh, no. council on that one. The wagon should go across. Because of our bull. Oh, no. <laughs> You killed him off. It's going to be bullets. <laughs> the last word of my wife was say, don't do it. Hey, I lost my entire family to drown, to drowning. Uh, this was pretty common. Why'd you send us first? Because <laughs> that's how the game works. The head of the company has to, uh, uh, All right, well, oh. now I'm despondent because I've lost my entire family. So, uh, I find wild sick. fruit. I guess that makes up for it. <laughs> so, do you marry on the trail when you find a All right. widow? I'm going to change my pace Her? because widow? I'm going to do a grueling pace and I'm going to change my ration to uh, uh, meager just to see what happens. I'm, I'm so depressed at the loss of my family that I've stopped eating. <laughs> Inadequate grass. Whether it's hot or in June of 1848, very little water. Okay, Soda Springs. This really was kind of a destination. People often talked about the boiling water or the soda water. It was, um, it was a, a fun destination or fun uh, um, uh, side uh, wayside stop at the time. So, all right. Quite as fun with uh, my wife and three kids on the trail. Okay, Fort Hall, look around. I say it as a ghost. <laughs> you did it! What, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, I'm good. I have 333 pounds of food. Bear. Shoot it. Nice. 
<laughs> Can they attack you? No. That one you're hunting. Yeah, they otherwise. Yeah, I think there's messages about. Okay, I got 245 pounds of meat. You're only able to carry 100 pounds back to the wagon. Okay, so there are stories of people who weren't very good at hunting, and the wives kind of being annoyed that their husbands didn't know how to shoot, so uh, they had to trade uh, with Indians um, for, for food. I have typhoid. All right, let's talk a little bit about typhoid. Uh, it's a fever, causes constipation, mild vomiting. Uh, it's spread largely through unsafe food, or unsafe um, food and water. Okay, uh, remember I talked about water before? 1848, we were in the middle of a pandemic in the United States, the cholera pandemic. Um, it was a global pandemic. Uh, it started in India, went through Europe and, and America, North America. Um, cholera was very, very um, contagious. How did it spread? Well, um, it spread through contaminated water. Uh, cholera caused pretty significant diarrhea, which caused significant dehydration. People of the day didn't know about sanitation, and so when you took care of your business, you were usually close to water supply, and then that would infect the water supply. And it really wasn't the best conditions. And so you had about six to 12,000 people died of disease, which, um, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, Indian attacks, about three to 4,000 people. Freezing and scurvy, about three to 500 people died of each of those. And then you had drownings, shootings, accidental shootings, miscellaneous, and runovers, about 200 to 500 each. Runovers, one of those. Well, kids, as they're trying to get up into the wagon as they're moving, they often fell, and they got run over. Um, it, it, it was a very, very common um, occurrence. And there's, there's a number of diaries that uh, mention it, how so-and-so broke their leg or whatnot. There's, there's one, well, let's combine two stories to make it even worse. So there's one story of a, a young boy that had his legs run over, um, and there was no doctor, or rather there was a doctor, and the doctor said, oh yeah, let's, let's help you out here. So he kind of did some bandaging and whatnot, and that's all he did. And then uh, a different doctor came along after nine days and looked, and nothing had been done to this young boy. And the bandages hadn't changed and whatnot, and they had to amputate the, the legs because it was gangrene. The, the young boy said, I think there's worms crawling on my legs. So it just was not a, it was an unsafe thing to do. So it's typhoid, typhoid and cholera aren't the same? Not the same, no. Yeah. no. But both very contagious. Okay, we're at Snake River. Okay, here's another portrayal of a Native American. Um, it was a guide, which is not inaccurate. A lot of the Natives were able to uh, show travelers, help them out. They would trade for salmon a lot. They would uh, uh, help individuals out. All right, six feet deep. I learned my lesson, and I'm going to uh, hire Oh, we don't even have a, f a ferry here. Okay, I'm gonna hire a Indian to help. Shoshone guy says that he will take your wagon across the river in exchange for three sets of clothing. Yes, I will accept the offer. You have lots of clothes. Same thing. Give it children's clothes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Shoshone knew a lot better what to do than I did earlier, so. All right, keep going. So your health is getting worse. Yeah, my health is very poor. 
Broken wagon wheel, would you like to try to repair it? Yes. Okay. You need to replace it with a spare part. There we go. Cholera. I have cholera. Okay, cholera. Let's talk. I talked a little bit about it, but uh, let's see. So after exposure, you would show symptoms about two to five hours after that. So it was very, very fast. Um, dehydration was significant. Um, it was spread through unsafe water or food. It affected the children most severely. Um, and it, it, oh, that's the, remember my 100 and, 150,000 people that died? That was the cholera epidemic. So the total Americans who died from cholera between 1832 and 1849 is 150,000 Americans. So it was a significant outbreak at the time. All right, Fort Boise, here we go. Those are clearly not my family. All right, check supplies. You know, you really should be eating more food. Oh, yeah, switch it. Peter, get to. All right, I'll, uh, you have the food. <laughs> I'll change my pace, steady pace, and then I'll change my food rations to filling. And then I will keep going. Bring a little water. Rough trail. So, after Fort, Fort Bo Boise, obviously you're in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. This is a little bit difficult to go. Oh, oh, I died. I come here. Oh, I was going to say, who's, going, who's taking the thing? Um, he should have listened to his <laughs> <laughs> Should have listened to you. people in your party have died. Okay, what, are we, what have we learned from this game, either about the original Oregon Trail or about 1980s American culture? And you're obsessed with death. <laughs> obsessed with death? Uh, what's that? It was a hard life. We took a lot of yeah. risk. Yeah. Do you know what the game is? They somehow figured out a way to have certain yeah, I'm not sure what the random settings were and whatnot. Um, so, it's very male-centric. The thing that struck me was that it, um, and I don't know if it was just the imagery or just because I'm a man, I, playing it as a young kid and even looking at it now, it seems like as the man, this is, this is a man's journey kind of thing. And that the, the women and the children are supplements, appendages, I don't know how to say that exactly, but, um, and that is certainly a perspective. Um, presumably some of the men at the time in the 1840s and 50s would have felt that. But there has been a recent shift in how we've told the Oregon Trail story to try to bring in the women's voices. And it's actually kind of interesting because once the decision was made to go to Oregon, the wives really didn't have much of a say. They just had to do it. They had to go along. They weren't thrilled with it. They didn't love it. Um, and yet, when they were on the trail, um, it kind of reinforced why they didn't love it. They, had to do all of the domestic chores. They had to cook, they had to clean, um, they had to do all that. But they also had to step up and do some of the more uh, masculine chores of, of leading the oxen or, or sometimes even going out to hunt. And they weren't really rewarded on the trail for kind of that, um, that stepping things up. But when they got to the West, the women in the West were, uh, how do I say it, there was a certain level of freedom that Western women enjoyed a little bit more than Midwestern or Eastern women. Um, part of that is because 
you know, women were a rare commodity, um, and if your husband was mistreating you or not appreciating you, um, it wasn't too challenging to say, okay, well, if you don't want to help me out or don't want to support me, then I can find some other person to, to do it. Um, there's also a sense from the women's diaries that um, they kind of recognized the trail to what it was. Men feared um, and even kind of attacked the natives much more so than if you're reading the women's diary, they're, they're recognizing the true dangers of the Oregon Trail, which was disease. They, they encounter or they wrote in there about the diseases in their journal and they kind of um, accepted the fact that natives could help, that the Native Americans knew the country, they knew what was helpful. Um, I, when I was reading some of this, I kind of compared it to the stereotype of, you know, when a husband and wife are on a journey, the wife is more willing to stop and ask for directions than the man, right? So that, that, that kind of is, is what I felt about that as well. So, um, All right. Along those lines, what I always found interesting about this game is it's essentially a home economics game. Yeah. So it is male centric, but it's about like budgeting for a household. It's yeah. about like a portion of money supply. It's about like very domestically money. Yeah, right? that's so, it. Like, and it's interesting that they were teaching that in the 80s, you know, trying to like, you know, make men, like boys and girls a little bit more equal. That is a everybody great point. Should participate that is a that. great point. So yeah. It's, yeah. I, I, I never really. I was thought it was interesting. I was like, oh, I'm a girl playing, but I get the gun or whatever. I yeah, don't know. yeah. No, that's a good point. That, that hadn't occurred to me. But yeah, you're absolutely right that, you know, some of this, this uh, home economics, worrying about food, you know, some of these, you could consider them domestic sphere type stuff. That was very much an a introduction for all players. Yeah. Well, um, Oregon Trail largely ended by 1869. Transcontinental Railroad. Um, once the railroad was in place, uh, it took you about seven days and cost you sixty-five dollars to get from Missouri to Oregon. So, just uh, I just can't even imagine, you know, what the people in Oregon or Utah or California or anywhere else were thinking about that. That, that railroad really was life-changing. It was life-changing for uh, a lot of folks, a lot of living things. Bison, of course, um, there's these stories of herds of bison that took all day to go through the prairies, and this was seen as free meat by the, by the settlers. Um, the Native Americans were extremely helpful early on, and then they realized, wait, this is a never-ending stream of immigrants that are coming in. And, and as they were seeing their homes being taken over, it, it's not at all surprising that they got aggressive. That they're like, wait, what's going on? Why are you not recognizing our way of life, our independence, our humanity? And the, the white folks that came across didn't. They, they saw the natives as a subclass, um, saw them as part of the wilderness to be tamed. Um, and so that was, that was um, so uh, life-altering for the, the native tribes that were here uh, in, in, the, in the West. Um, but there's, it's still romanticized. There, there's still this mythology of the West, the unexplored, the, the um, open lands of the West. Um, but there's still this mentality of kind of never-ending resources. You know, we, we've had a very wonderful winter, but um, you can still kind of sense this, this attitude that we'll always have water, we'll always have land, we'll always have something, and it's not always the case. We, we, we can't run out of resources. Uh, it is possible. Maybe, maybe we need to start um, thinking of our impact on the land uh, and on our neighbors and upon one another. So anyway, um, Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your attendance. Um, and I hope that um, for those that played the game, this was a trip down memory lane and you learned something. For those that never played the game, maybe you can relate to your, uh, the, the younger people in your lives. Um, and when someone says, 
I've died of cholera, you'll, you'll understand the reference. So thank you so much. Thank you.